The interception fighter's function is to catch something and shoot it down. When the fighter is flying faster than a bullet, guns are not of much use. Rockets capable of launch at Mach 3 did not exist in 1960. So once again, something had to be invented because of the Blackbirds. The Hughes developed missile system for the YF-12 would later be reborn as the Phoenix system of the Grumman F-14 Tomcat because the big black plane was never adopted as a long-range interceptor. As a sole function aircraft, it simply did not fit the prevailing mood. Many people were astonished at the decision. For if the requirement had been solely for an interceptor, then surely here was the plane. However, politically, it reflected the wrong philosophy. Resentment over the decision lingered for many years. The SR-71 was announced by President Johnson on July 24, 1964. It came as somewhat of a surprise to Lockheed because the SR-71 was supposed to be the RS-71 or the R-71. The R stood for reconnaissance and the S ambiguously for strike. However, it was decided that the President's name would stick as standing for strategic reconnaissance. The SR-71 took off for its first flight on December 22, 1964. The flight was a complete success. Everything worked, and the pilots and mechanics were happy with the aircraft. The flight testing program proceeded well, most major problems having already been sorted out during the experience of the A-12 and YF-12 projects. The SR-71 progressed to acceptance tests at Edwards Air Force Base on August 13, 1965 and proceeded smoothly through testing and into service. Enough information about the Blackbirds continued to seep out to ensure that they became one of the most famous secrets in the world. Aircraft enthusiasts came to know enough about the plane and its capabilities to develop an appreciation of the achievement it represented. Only top-of-the-line pilots were eligible to fly the SR-71. Requirements were about the same as for the astronaut program. There were no shortages of applicants for the job, however. fancy escape capsules built into the aircraft. Kelly Johnson figured that the spacesuit the pilot wore was already an adequately controlled environment, and he concentrated on how to get the pilot clear of the plane at Mach 3. The ejection seat and parachutes inevitably had to be specially developed. was troublesome to maintain and became progressively more expensive to keep flying. Each airframe had its own personality, a fact that pilots became very aware of. This may in part be due to the nature of the metal. Kelly Johnson asserted that each flight above Mach 3 would effectively retemper the alloy, theoretically giving the planes the strength to go on forever. However, coupled with what was essentially hand construction, this also gave each plane its own characteristics. 
pilot instruction called for a special training variant. The SR-71 was a plane unlike any other, and simulators and other training aids were little preparation for the real thing. The trainer sat in a second cockpit, stepped above the normal clean lines of the airframe. It was cramped and afforded little view, but there was only so much that could be done to the shape without losing supersonic ability. To give an example, the A-12 trainer, nicknamed the Titanium Goose, was not even capable of flight at Mach 2, far short of the standard aircraft's ability. Most of the serious candidates for the job of SR-71 pilot had logged over 3,000 flying hours. There were around three jobs a year, and one can only guess at the number of applicants. One pilot, Colonel Robert Powell, was to log a total of 1,020 hours flying the SR-71. This meant that he had more hours in his logbook at above Mach 3 than any other pilot in the world. In those hours, he flew over a million miles. He also earned 17 air medals and two distinguished flying crosses. It is not surprising that there were so many applicants for the job of pilot. It is also not surprising that the criteria were exclusive. Selection for the training took about a year. Special care was taken to weed out Top Gun types. SR-71 operations required a steady, team-oriented temperament that was as important as a security clearance. The ability to manage the systems correctly and constantly was given as much weight as flying ability. At over 30 miles per minute, there is not much piloting to do once a mistake has been made. No one could be allowed to fly one of these birds like a cowboy. A critical key to the Blackbirds had been the development of a fuel that would not burn simply because of the heat in the tanks, which, like the rest of the plane, got very hot at high speed. In addition, unlike virtually any other fuel, it had to be burnable at extreme altitude. Once the fuel had been developed, other problems seemed small by comparison. Soon after each takeoff, the plane refueled. By 1990, the Air Force was paying a reported $400 million a year to keep its 20 SR-71s operation. And Congress decided this was too much. The allocation was canceled. The Blackbirds were doomed. They had spent their entire career in secret, and the immensely high cost of developing them was probably their best kept secret. Sometime in the next century, information about them may be released. Until then, much about the SR-71 remains a mystery. The last SR-71 flight on March 6, 1990, was a fitting end to the story. The plane flew from California to Washington in 68 minutes, 17 seconds. The flight was another record. There has been no other plane 
like the blackbird. There probably never will be. If a major factor in establishing the greatness of an achievement is to compare it with its contemporaries, to what do we compare the blackbird? Certainly nothing else of 1958 vintage, and nothing that has been produced since. The blackbird stands alone and is probably the greatest aircraft ever built. That, at least, is not a secret. <laughs>